So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is making advertising claims for menopause cosmetics. So I'm sure you are all seeing the same as I am, where it's become a really hot, like trending thing in the cosmetics industry. Um, it's cosmetics formulated particularly to combat um, the symptoms of menopause that can happen on a cosmetic side. We're not talking about medical products here, we're talking about cosmetics. Um, so I thought it'd be really nice to put together a webinar, drawing together some of the information I've heard and really relate that back to how we can advertise these kinds of products to consumers whilst abiding by the correct regulations and making sure we're not misleading or anything like that. So today's webinar is being recorded, um, so I'll be sending out the recording at the end. There's also going to be the chance for a QA. and a um, so if you've got any questions as we go through the webinar today, just feel free to pop them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them at the end or, or feel free to share them in the chat if you want to chat with other participants as well, um, please do feel free to do so. So just to run through the agenda for today. Been looking at a little bit of an overview of the cosmetics, the menopause cosmetics industry. Why am I talking about it? What kind of things have I seen trending? Um, the cosmetic impacts of the menopause. So, like I said, we've got different symptoms. But I'm going to talk about what the cosmetic symptoms are um, so we can kind of all be on the same page there. We'll be looking at how adverts are regulated and obviously looking at how we substantiate our advertising claims. Um, so I'll be looking at a case study to show you some study design and then showing you how we actually put that into our marketing as well. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Regulatory Director at Aiton Global Research. Um, so I specialise in advertising regulations and claim substantiation. So obviously this is my kind of cup of tea talking about how we do uh, regulate certain types of advertising claims. And again, how we can substantiate those as well. Um, I really specialise in designing studies to fit people's requirements. So wherever they want to advertise their products and whatever pro platforms they want to advertise on, I make sure their study design is going to allow them to do so. So if you've ever got a project, feel free to get in touch. So let's start off thinking about the menopause markets. Um, so yeah, why are we talking about it? So uh, I found a couple of excerpts from articles um, that I thought really summarized um, how this, the industry is growing at the moment. Um, so from Glossy, they said that AARP have founded a national survey of 2000 women, um, that there is a spend of about 22 billion a year on beauty products. Now, yes, this is called talking generically about beauty products of a certain age, um, you know, sort of, well, menopausal age, sort of anything above 40, we're looking at going into that perimenopausal, menopausal age. Um, and this is the age group that we're looking at and how much they spend on beauty products. So if they're spending that much on beauty products, we know that if they've got anything going on with their skin that has been affected because of the menopause, um, they're going to be spending their money on those things as well. So it's a really important thing to think about is how big that market is, that target age range. This is what they're spending. So it'd be great to be a part of that spend as well. 70% uh, of those are um, those aged, sorry, 40%, 40 and older. <laughs> God, mess that right up. 70% of those aged 40 and older want to see more beauty and personal care products for perimenopausal and menopausal women. So 70% of people in this target age range do want to see in your advertising claims that the products will help with um, menopause and perimenopause. So it's really important um, to make sure we're communicating that to the consumers because it's what they want to see on the market. Um, so from Bloomberg as well, they reported, um, so from Female, Female Founders Fund, um, did release a report as well to say that about 1 billion women worldwide are expected to be in the menopause by 2025, uh, 20, yeah, 2025, sorry, starting everything again today. <laughs> um, so it's a $600 billion opportunity for businesses. So again, it's just looking at, this is the target age range. They're spending a lot on cosmetics. Let's be a part of it. From that Females Founders Fund report, I thought this was a really interesting um, chart that came out of that report. We said about the symptoms. Now, these are obviously symptoms that are um, not cosmetic necessarily. They are medical as well. But I thought it was really interesting to see what's really common um, in terms of what, what, what women are experiencing in terms of symptoms of the menopause. Really at the top of the list there is night sweats. Now, there is certain cosmetics on the market that are cooling and things like that. And you can really see it's such a good um, target when we're looking at kind of how we're kind of 
uh, making those products as well. And then right down to things like burning tongue, which I didn't even know was a side effect of the menopause, but people are having problems with it. So it's really interesting to see all the different breakdowns of symptoms there as well. Um, so what are the stages of menopause? I keep saying about perimenopause and I thought, well, let's actually break down what that is because certain, cause, um, certain products are going to target the different stages um, because obviously there's going to be different symptoms as you kind of go through the menopause. So it's really important to know what those stages are and know how you're going to develop your products um, and what the sort of things they're going to target as well. So the perimenopause can begin eight to 10 years before the menopause. And it's basically when women stop producing as much estrogen. So it can start as, as early as in your thirties, but it's usually for women in their forties. Um, and it can last about um, two, one to two years. Um, oh no, sorry, in the last one to two years, the estrogen um, levels, the, the drop in estrogen levels accelerate. So um, that's when people really start to experience those symptoms as well. Then the menopause is actually only a really a short period of time um, with in between, you know, with the overall cycle as a whole. So it's when the woman stops having um, periods. And it's basically when you haven't had a period for about 12 um, consecutive months, you're then considered menopausal. And then after um, the menopause, which is about a year long, um, they have the postmenopause, and it's the name given to a period um, after a woman has not bled for an entire year. Um, so it's basically once you've had like started going through the menopause, the rest of your life is then postmenopause. So there's still symptoms that you get, um, and it says it can be kind of a decade up to a decade after the menopause, you'll still get some of those symptoms. So if you really think about this overall cycle, uh, we have got a long period of time where people are going to have symptoms of the menopause, especially when you're thinking about cosmetics and hair and skin and everything like that. Um, we're going to we're going to have, be able to target that age range for quite a while. So I thought it was really interesting to sort of look at that cycle and start thinking about how that can be reflected in product development. Um, Avon as well did some consumer insights. Um, so they released a report about their about the menopausal um, kind of researching menopausal women to support their campaign, um, their advertising campaign for their cosmetics. So really looking at how um, we're able to sell these kinds of products as well. Um, this is a very clever way of uh, basically selling your products is by saying this problem exists and we have the products to target it. So I would recommend for people that are looking at, you know, certain types of um, kind of campaigns for advertising, getting market research behind it. It's really, really effective. Um, so this isn't obviously about their products. They haven't tested their products to get this information. They're just doing some market research about women who are menopausal um, and then it supports their product marketing campaign as well. So they did um, this survey with 100 people in all of these countries. So Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, India, UK, Poland, and Russia. They had 100 people in each territory. Um, and some of the insights they found uh, were 44% of women were unaware they were pe uh, met perimenopausal. So they started having symptoms. So what we talked about before, it can be 10 to eight years before. And that last two years is when you start to get the symptoms. Um, many people didn't expect, so 46% did not expect it, 34% don't understand the two phases of perimenopause, and 46% of women did not feel prepared for the menopause. So it's really, they're looking at this kind of target group, say there is an issue, and we need to start educating our consumers about what the perimenopause is, and then giving them the solutions um, cosmetically to some of their symptoms. So some of the cosmetic symptoms they've brought out. 69% uh, of people had issues with dry or sensitive skin during the menopause, so a huge percentage of people. Um, Mexico in particular had the highest rate, um, and UK had the lowest rate of sensitive skin, but still 40%, so still a huge market there. So I think what's really important now, we start talking about cosmetic symptoms, other symptoms. What are the cosmetic symptoms of the menopause? So we had Lake Personal Care come to um, the SCS to give some talk about menopause. And I thought this was brilliant. They outlined eight characteristics of menopausal skin, which is what we can really start to think about when we're talking about cosmetic products. Um, and, you know, what, what kind of things are we looking at combating? It's really important to break down and go, right, what are the characteristics? Because then we can look at developing those products um, to combat them. So that eight characteristics were increased sensitivity, increased facial hair, skin dryness, skin thinning, 
adult acne, topography, loss of skin elasticity and surface and changes in skin color and texture. So there's a lot of differences. There's a lot of changes that can happen to the skin, as we can see. And then, as I said, once we've got those characteristics, this is what we want to communicate to the consumers. If this is the issues that we know they're facing, this is what our advertising claims should be demonstrating they can benefit against. So what is an advertising claim? <laughs> um, so obviously this is, it's all, you probably all know, but I think it's always good to be on the same page and say this is what an advertising claim actually is. So it's any claim that's used to market a product, um, it appears on pack, um, but it can also appear in any communication that's in the public domain, basically, whether it's a website, social media, TV, it's all an advertising claim. The reason for an advertising claim is to describe what the product does. Um, so as I said, if it's to target dry skin, that's an advertising claim saying you can target it um, and anything else, basically. And it's the reason for this is because we want consumers to be able to choose our product. So if we tell them what the product does, they can make that choice to, to buy it, basically. Um, so that's really the point of it. On the other side, it's also really important for competition because we're all very good in saying the product uh, targets dry skin, but there are many, many products on the market that target dry skin. So what else can you say about your product? That's where it comes into the more marketing side. Um, you know, what helps it stand out in a crowded market? What helps it make you look better than your competition? And it's really using those claims um, to, to support your marketing and make sure you can say some really fantastic things about your product to make people want to choose it over and above everyone else. Um, so as you can see, there's examples around the page there of how um, advertising claims are used um, on TV and on website and social media as well. So how are they regulated? So as I said, it's really make, we need to make sure that if we're going to say these things about our product, we know who's going to be looking at our advertising claims and making sure we're abiding by the rules. So no matter what kind of product you have, um, so whether it's a cosmetic or it's a medicine or it's, uh, I don't know, a, a, an app, <laughs> everything goes through the same um, kind of overall regulation for advertising. And that's usually a self-regulatory organization in most cases. Um, so I'll, for example, in the UK, you have the Advertising Standards Authority. As I said, in most cases, it's self-regulatory because in uh, the US, you have, for example, the Federal Trade Commission, which are federal. Um, but yes, let's assume that it's uh, all self-regulatory for now uh, to make things really simple because most countries work in that way. So what does it mean? It means that instead of someone looking at all the adverts you put out there and going, yep, that's that's fine, that's compliant, check, check, check. It's up to you to make sure your adverts are compliant. Um, so every advertising self-regulatory organization has a code of conduct that you need to abide by to sell your products um, legally. So um, what they'll do, what you, so it's up to, it's your responsibility to know what that code is and make sure you're abiding by the rules. Does it mean that if you don't abide by the rules, no one's gonna pick up on it at all? No, it doesn't. There is a complaints basis essentially. Um, where either your consumer who purchases your product, maybe it says, um, you know, this product will help cool you down if you're having a hot flush. Um, and someone uses it goes, you know, this does absolutely nothing. I'm not feeling this at all. I don't think that, you know, they've got any kind of substance behind that claim. Then they can complain to the Advertising Standards Authority, who will investigate it and see what their evidence is behind it. If there's no evidence behind it, you'll be asked to remove your adverts. Obviously, if that's on your website or social media, very easy. You can kind of remove it. Um, if it's not, um, if it's on your pack copy, that could be a product recall to make sure that you don't have your advert out there. So it's really important to make sure you are abiding by those rules. Um, even if you remove your advert, it's all in the public domain. And often news articles will pick up on, um, you know, people getting caught out for not having substance behind their claims so it can be really bad press as well so it's really important to make sure that your adverts are substantiated when you put them on the market as well as your consumers your competitors may also complain as well so usually it's if you've got a product um, and you're saying some amazing advertising claims about it and they've gone hang on we can say that about our product so how come you can say about your product how did you get the evidence for that um, and that's really where people will, will complain about your product as well. So it's it's really important to know what those codes of conduct are. 
You've got um, a couple of resources here if you're like, okay, well, I'm advertising in Germany and France, Spain, USA, Australia. What are the advertising standards authorities in those countries? Well, you can look at the International Chamber of Commerce. You have a framework um, that other countries adopt, and most main markets have adopted that same framework, so you can see who they are. Um, and again, it's all kind of the same framework as well, so the rules are very consistent throughout the countries. And there's also the International Council of Advertising Self-Regulation, or ICAS, um, and they also have members um, that are around the world as well. So you can have a look on their members list and see who's there. Um, so it's really, um, yeah, really helpful resources if you're not sure. As I said, many countries follow the same thing. So it's really important to make sure you're looking country specific, but don't panic too much. It's not generally a case of if you're advertising in one country, it's gonna be completely uncompliant in the other one they all follow the kind of same structure and that you have to have substance behind your adverts and you have to abide by the rules. One of those rules being is understanding what you can say about your product, depending on what the product category is. So in this case, I've just pulled up what a medicine is and what a cosmetic is, because when you're looking at things like menopause, this the lines can be blurred because you don't want to say anything about your product curing symptoms or anything like that because then it would be a medicine so as you can see a medicine is something as a substance or a combination of substances that treat prevent diagnose or diagnose a disease or restore um, and correct or modify physiological functions that are caused by basically diseases and illnesses and things like that so as you said you know in menopause obviously it's not a disease necessarily but it is a medical thing that people go through and if you say you know this treats and cures hot flushes it can't do that because it's unless it's a medicine it can't do that so a cosmetic is anything um, any substance that's placed in contact with external parts of the human body, the epidermis, hair system, nails, lips, um, and external genital organs, or with the teeth and mucous membranes. Um, and it basically should clean them, perfume them, change the appearance, correct body odors, um, protect them or keep them in good condition. So this is really where we're saying about the cosmetic um, symptoms of menopause and where that late personal care um, eight characteristics really comes into handy because you're thinking about, right, what are the changes to the skin? And then on a cosmetic level, how can we have one of these kind of either um, protect them or improve their appearance or something like that? Because that's what the cosmetic is supposed to do. So very important that when we're advertising, we really are thinking about the product category, and making sure we're abiding by those rules. So I also want to pick up just to make things really, because I keep talking about these codes and everything like that, and that's all very well and good. Um, but what do they actually kind of look like? So the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK have information about cosmetic advertising claims. And a few of the things that they bring up very importantly, be careful you don't make a medicine, medicinal claim, as I said, I wanted to kind of bring that, <laughs> loop that in. But also important things is you must hold um, appropriate scientific evidence to substantiate your claims. Um, you need to make sure um, that the cosmetic effect, um, basically if it goes uh, against a simple cosmetic effect, you need to have robust evidence to support it. Um, so for example, moisturizing the skin is very simple, improving the appearance of dark spots, less simple. You need to have some really good evidence to support that. Um, and the product name itself as well may, um, may actually kind of be a claim, if you know what I mean. So, you know, especially if it's, you know, something about menopause, it could be like um, dry skin moisturizer. Well, you've already said dry skin moisturizer. It's, that's your claim, it moisturizes dry skin. So you need to make sure that you are really aware of what you're saying about even the name of your product, because it, can, it needs to be substantiated as well. Also think of things like cumulative effects. If you want to say skin gets better over time, you need to have data to show that the skin is improving um, and things like that as well. So yeah, just really kind of brings, ties it all in so you can see what the kind of codes are that are out there, what guidance is out there from those advertising authorities. We also need to think about the cosmetic regulations. Um, so obviously we that's our advertising regulation. That applies to every single kind of, product category it's all getting um reviewed uh, well it's, it's all kind of dealt with with advertising standards authorities but we also need to think about what the cosmetics regulations are and what they're saying so the eu cosmetic regulation has six common criteria for cosmetic claims 
And just to quickly run through them, you've got legal compliance, your product needs to be legally compliant, but you also can't use that as a claim. Um, because obviously, if you're saying, oh, we abide by the EU cosmetics regulation, well, every product on the market does that. So it's not something that's in particular to your brand. You need to be truthful about the product. Um, so obviously, if you're saying it, you know, it could be it contains very cooling aloe vera, um, you need to make sure you've got aloe vera in that product or at least to a level that it could be perceived by the consumer. Uh, you need to have evidential supports. Of course, that's really the real take home from my side um, and something that I'll go through in a case study really shortly. You need to be honest about your data. You can't say that um, you know, you've got 100 women that agree that this is the best thing for the menopause ever if actually you only ran the study on 50 people. And be really transparent. I think that's the important thing I always say there. If you do have data about your product, put it into your advertising so that your consumers can see what that data is. Really brag about it. You've put the money into getting this research on your products. Really show it off. Um, and it will make you more trustworthy to your consumers as well. You need to be fair, so especially for comparison claims, you need to be fair to your competition and compare like for like. If you're doing comparative claims, make sure that it's the same, you know, it's not an anti-dandruff shampoo compared to something that builds up a lot in the hair because one's going to cause more dandruff than the other. You need to be two anti-dandruff shampoos that are compared. Essentially, the reason we're doing it is to make sure that your consumers can make an informed decision about purchasing your product. That is why we're doing all of these things. So the more honest and truthful and more evidence you have behind your products, the more informed your, your consumers will be to make that decision. So claim substantiation then. So I'm going to talk today about consumer claim substantiation because that is the case study I'm going to run us through. So when we're talking about what that is, there's kind of two, I mean, there's, there's few branches really about claim substantiation, but we, we can break it down into kind of two arms. One is clinical, one is consumer. Clinical studies are your objective instrumental measures. So for example, if we're talking about fine lines and wrinkles, um, if you want to say fine lines and wrinkles are reduced by 30%, the appearance is reduced by 30%, there is no way a consumer can use product and go, yeah, my wrinkles were reduced by 30%. You need to have some kind of instrumental studies there um, to get that evidence behind it. Consumer studies are going to be used for perception claims. So it may be that my um, I really felt the difference in my cool my hot flushes by this cooling product. Um, it could be you know my dry skin caused by the menopause feels really relieved. It's all of those things that a consumer feels um, and things that they're going to have an opinion on essentially. That's what we're getting through consumer research. So it's really good for menopause because. Everybody has very different um, symptoms and the way that symptoms affect them is going to be, you know, it's very personal. So when we're talking about symptoms feeling relieved. We want to make sure we're asking the consumers if they agree with it. It's all very well and good having those instrumental studies, but this is something that is very um, emotional and, um, and kind of personal. So consumer research really gives us some great marketing data when we're looking at, um, at putting our claims out there as well. So it's generally done by an in-home user study because we want to reflect the actual conditions of the product in use. So we're sending the products to the volunteers uh, to test at home and use it as they, as they would if they were to purchase the product off the shelves by following the usage instructions. And again, you're getting them in their natural setting using a product as they usually would. So it really reflects um, what people are going to get when they get when they are getting around a circle when they purchase your product off the shelf. The reason I'm saying this is because obviously if you are saying, to, you know, if you're getting people complain about your products, it's less likely to happen if you've actually reflected that same test condition. Um, so they can also compare products as well. But as I said, you might need some additional evidence. That's something we really help with. So if I have a client come to me and say, these are all the claims I want to make, I'll say, right, this we can do a consumer research. This one, we might need to word differently. We might have to get an instrumental study. Um, it's really important to make sure you have someone who knows what kind of evidence is required um, to review those claims. So let's look at a case study because it's all very well and good talking about this all hypothetically, but I think a case study is always um, the most helpful when we're talking about research and how you kind of design that really. 
So um, this is a night cream, not a night cream, uh, who tested for a retail pharmacy, um, which are a global leader in retail pharmacy, consumer health and cosmetics. They wanted to test their night cream to evaluate the efficacy of the product and to gain the feedback from menopause women. Does it actually work? Um, do they kind of have the effects that we want to get? So always really important things about research as well. We were talking about this a bit yesterday. I was on a panel discussion. Don't really just think of it as ticking a box and getting your consumer research to get your claims substantiated. You want to make sure that you actually know your product works and get that feedback. Because if they say, do you know what? You asked me all of these questions about, did it help my dry skin? But do you know what? It really helped cool my skin down. That's the kind of language you want to communicate back to your consumers that help you develop your claims to make the most success of your marketing as well. Um, so yeah, they wanted to gain spot data for claims focusing on menopausal skin symptoms, including dry and aging skin. So who do we recruit for the study? Because that's the most important thing. We want to reflect the target consumer. And again, that's a really good bonus of doing consumer research. You can really pinpoint who your target consumer is. So obviously it's menopausal women between the age of 45 and 65. So we're targeting that whole menopause cycle, the peri, the post, the menopause. We've got all the age ranges in there that will help us target that. Uh, we've got an even split of skin types, so normal, dry and oily combinations. We want people to have fine lines and wrinkles because we want to see how the product um, works with the fine lines and wrinkles. And also dull skin because, again, the product's been formulated to target dull skin as well. So what were the test conditions? So they had to use the product, as I said, as usually would on in home. So we have to make sure we're basically using the same language that they would get on pack. So they had to apply to their face every uh, every night for two weeks, and then they answered a question at the end. Um, they had to basically, as I said, apply it with those um, with whatever it's going to say on pack. So gently massage into the skin, apply it every night, uh, massage until absorbed. Um, areas of use are on the face. Restrictions of use are really important as well. So this was a retinol product. So they had to put restrictions and say to use it on the face only because the neck and decolletage is more sensitive to retinol. So what were the results? We sent this product out to the volunteers. They used it for the two weeks and answered that questionnaire. We get a whole report saying about how the product performed. Right at the end, we get this lovely summary that says, Okay, for every claim, what percentage of people actually agreed with it? Because that's what goes into our advertising. So that's where you see the percentage of people agree claims. So um, in this case, we've got the claims on the, sorry, claims on the left. Then we've got the number of people satisfied and not satisfied. And then the percentage of people satisfied and not satisfied. So the claims we can take out from this, 83% of 57 people said that their skin looked more radiant. 84% said it helped um, regain that helped their skin to regain moisture. 74% said it helped to reduce the appearance of fine lines. And 91% of people said it was suitable for their menopausal skin. So again, these are all really nice um, advertising claims. They can literally lift straight out that and put into their advertising. What does, oh, sorry, what, what's the legislation very quickly? Um, so as I said, it's really good to hear about how you're supposed to use these, um, these what these regulations are, but what do they actually say? So I'd like to think about what's actually relevant to that case study. Why did we conduct the case study? Well, for subjective claims, the EU cosmetic regulation said that all claims should be supported by um, re re relevant and robust evidence, whether it's subjective, objective, established or new, and that a subjective claim can be a sensory performance or aesthetic claim based on consumer perception as it expresses the consumer's experience when using the product. But what does that research actually look like in advertising? So I want to go back to Avon because we had their lovely market research to support their campaign. But then what kind of products did they have and what were they saying about it? So they had a product for hot flushes, their cooling elixir facial mist. Um, and they said that 100% of women saw an instant decrease in skin temperature after an icy cool spritz. So this was a clinical trial and it was a one minute post application of 22 trialists. Um, so you can see as well, they're quite low, they always bit lower in participants for clinical trial because you have an expert assessor. For a consumer study, you tend to have many more because obviously they're using it at home. So we need to get more data to make it more robust. 
Um, they also had their hydro rescue on on the go serum, and 98% of people said it um, gave a moisture boost. And again, it's a clinical study with 31 participants. So you can really see how that um, data is um, put into the advertising to really um, kind of elevate it. And again, be very transparent about where that data has come from. So to summarize, I see some questions coming in. So I'm going to summarize and then we'll do a bit of a Q&A. So it is essential to use advertising claims to stand out against your competition. So as I mentioned, it's, you know, especially for this kind of um, product in particular, because menopausal um, skin is going to have so many particular issues, you need to communicate that in your advertising. A well-designed study and questionnaire is really essential for valuable data. Don't get tripped up with health or medicinal claims. Make sure that they are cosmetic claims for menopausal products. Make sure it's compliant in the country you are selling in. So make sure you see what those regulations are. Always present your advertising very clearly to avoid scrutiny and always use recent evidence in your advertising. Formulations develop over time. Make sure you're revisiting those claims and updating them. It's really important that it's recent as well. So I'm going to go to a q and I said I can see some things in the chat coming up. Um, so let's have a little look. Um, so in, in this particular one, oh, sorry, sorry, someone's asked about the, um, the age that we had in the case studies. So the age could possibly be 40. Someone's come, come up earlier. Um, so yeah, this one was 45 to 65 because that's the age range this client was targeting. But of course, you can look at making that different. We've done many menopausal studies where we've looked at kind of from age like 35 up until 65. It really depends on who you're trying to target in your advertising. So whilst you can have it more open, this is why I was saying a consumer study should really reflect your target demographic. So if that target demographic is 45 to 65, that's what you want to have. If you wanted to do um, 40 to 60, make sure that that's who you have as well. So of course it can be wider, it can be narrower. It might even be like one year, that one menopausal year we're looking at, um, but we need to make sure that it's reflecting who you're going to advertise your products to. Um, so any more questions coming in? I'll give you a minute, but obviously I'll be putting out my um, my email address at the end of this study as well, at the end of the study, at the end of the webinar, I'll put out my email address. Um, so if anybody wants to um, contact me directly, if they've got any questions about advertising um, claims for menopause, do let me know. I can see um, Dan Whitby as well, who is actually from Lake Personal Care, um, did join the study. And I have to say, if you guys have want to develop any cosmetics for menopause, um, they are your go-to. They know a lot about the ingredients that will help you form formula, um, formulate products for that as well. So yeah, I would recommend reaching out to Lake Personal Care for menopausal cosmetics. Um, so um, we've had a, a question in from Lauren about the benchmark for a claim pass, basically. So if you said, um, you've said, is it 70% for the kind of pass rate we're looking at? So the percentage of people agreeing with a claim. So yeah, 70% tends to be the norm. Now there's not necessarily a strict regulation on this. It depends on the advertising platform, in fact. Um, so for television, it is 70%. For QVC, it is 70%. So generally, a lot of our um, clients do do 70%. As a standard, we do 66.6% .6 because that is a statistical majority. So if your claim passes that, you can, you can completely use it, um, depending on the platform you're looking at. But I, my kind of takeaway from that is to really think about um, yeah, where you're going to advertise it, because there will be certain restrictions there as well. So as with anything, I always say, make sure um, that you have, you understand where you're selling your product, what you're selling it on, because it will differ, you know, with all of that as well. Uh, and it says, does it differ with the size of the panel? Technically, no, but you need to make sure you have a statistically significant panel for any claim. That's always a great fun one as well. What size panel do I need to use for a claim? It really depends on what you're looking at um, reviewing, what the product is. Do you have any subgroups that you want to investigate? So usually just to kind of give a takeaway for today, I'd recommend around 100 responses for a consumer study. But as I said, always come and talk to us directly if you've got something in mind, because it depends on who you're testing on and what your claim is. Um, it will always be slightly different. So I hope that's answered your question. Um, 
So I, uh, I've got to do why this group has been focused. I'm not sure what that one is, unfortunately. Um, and oh, sorry, yeah, questions coming in. Sorry, I'm getting all scrambled with my questions. But as I said, I'll, I'll finish. I'll finish up the webinar for today, um, and then you can feel free to reach out to me if you've got any further questions as well. So I just want to finish up to say that IFSCC Congress is happening in 2022 and we will be sponsoring, we're very proud to be. So please do register your interest and come join us there. I do want to mention is SCS Formulates in a couple of weeks time. I'm sure many of you are going. It would be lovely to see you there. If you're going and you've got any projects you want to talk about, please do drop me an email. I'd love to meet you there. Um, and especially if you've got, you want to talk about menopausal advertising claims or any other projects, um, it would be great to have you there. Um, upcoming webinar, I have seen another question come in, by the way, but just drop me an email. I'll, be, I'll, I'll, um, I'll wrap up for today and then we can talk a bit further. Upcoming webinars as well. So um, in a couple of weeks time, I've got uh, beauty device. Oh no, this is next week. Beauty devices, is your marketing tooled up? Um, so we'll be looking at beauty devices and facial tools, all that kind of thing. And thinking about how that's regulated and what kind of advertising claims you can put put in to be effective there. And then in a couple of weeks time, I've got Buzz Beauty joining me, um, who will be looking at how to deal with reformulation. And in particular, looking at the EU ingredient bans that are coming in next year and how that can affect your whole supply chain and your, your claim substantiation data and giving you some really helpful tips on how to deal with that kind of thing. So there's my contact information. As I mentioned, I will be following up now with an email, which will have that all in there anyway, and the recording for the webinar. Just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that's been really helpful. And thanks for coping with me while I'm stumbling on my words today. It has been a long week. <laughs> and I hope that it's been, um, you've been able to keep up with it anyway. Um, so thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye.